Mira and I of Montreal, <laughs> August 1988. Right. Um, we started talking about your filmography, and I just wanted to make sure I got it straight. Um, these are the films I wrote down. Jama Masjid Street Journal must have been an early student project. Yes, it was my first uh, student thesis oh, for Harvard. Yes. Shot in Delhi. Yes. Oh, that must have been really uh, interesting. Was that um, uh, using the kind of direct cinema method that? Um, well, when I was studying film there, it was much less a school of thought like MIT had, which is, you know, purely cinema vahite. Mm -hmm. um, it was much more, you could do what you liked and they tried to help you, give you equipment or whatever. And uh, at that time at Harvard, I was studying with a, a New York filmmaker called, Al sorry, Alfred Gazzetti was my professor in general, and he's the one who introduced me to a number of films, notably um, Chris Marker and, mm -hmm. um, you know, those early documentaries of Jean Rouge even. Um, and those had a profound effect on me. But um, when I was making my thesis, I was directly studying with uh, Peter Hutton, who was a New York-based uh, filmmaker. And when I say studying, I mean very loosely, because we didn't mm -hmm. really study. Um, and Peter, uh, it was, he makes these black and white silent films, and they're purely visual. And in any case, inspired by the fact that I could do exactly as I pleased, you know, um, I returned to, to Jama Masjid, where around where I had gone to university mm -hmm. just a year before that for a couple of years. And I knew that area just as a person who walked the streets, um, observing. And the film is a very impressionistic essay of, um, um, you know, sh instead of a veil in front of me having a camera, because I shot it. And that was the whole deal. You have to shoot it and do everything. Mm -hmm. So it was conceived as a silent film mm -hmm. and uh, just a film a visual film, purely visual experience of the juxtaposition of uh, bizarre things next to each other, you know, mechanic shops and chicken auctions and the Moez and prayer, you know. But um, then I added this narration much later, which I now regret. <laughs> well, you can't regret things you've already done, can you? <laughs> History. <laughs> right, not regret, but I'm embarrassed by. Well, the narrations are sort of the, the standard, um, not only for Chris Marker, but also for yeah. Indian documentaries. Aren't yeah, they? yeah. Um, I was going to say that if you'd shot Sink Sound in, in that bazaar in your first film, that would have been mm. defying all odds, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, you shot 16 millimeter bolex. Yes, yes, uh, crank, hand crank, and, and I remember, um, and my friend Mitch Epstein helped me. He was with me most of the time, uh, and then Anna and Patwasan, who I had just met, uh, did some sound work for me, mm -hmm. which was post sync. I mean, nothing to do with sync, but yeah. So whoever I could grab, I grabbed. <laughs> Epstein worked on one of the later films, right? But I forget which one. He shot um, So Far From India and India Cabaret. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And with the new film, you're with the new cinematographer, right? Um, the new film, Salam Bombay, is shot by a woman, Sandy Sisso, mm -hmm. who's Los Angeles-based and, um, and comes from a tradition of documentary in mm -hmm. India. She did Mother Teresa and, oh. yeah, and some feature work uh, in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, but Mitch... Uh, worked as a second unit cinematographer. He did all the, you know, exterior sort of Bombay shots and mm -hmm. uh, and also did the production design of the film and co-produced it. We were just like doing whatever we could. I see. So it's more like an expansion of the basic crew rather than changing orientation. Yes. Oh, it needs a huge crew because mm -hmm. it was a pretty big film. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the next one I've got is Daddy's Family, which she worked on as assistant editor. Yeah. That was in the States? Yeah. It's a film about a joint family in Punjab and the roles of women within it. 
and uh, Michael Camerini and Rena Gill uh, directed it and uh, I was it was my first job um, for about I think six months I worked on it as an editor assistant editor so that's despite the fact that you're just an editor this team of women's roles in the family probably anticipates part of India cabaret doesn't it <laughs> they couldn't be more different <laughs> but um, um, well I, I never saw the connection in a the direct way but um, India Cabaret was more inspired by um, the exploration of the very strict line that exists between good women and bad women mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, in India and uh, usually that had to do something with sexuality mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> so it was an exploration of uh, of what is you know these double standards that exist in our society seen from the point of view of a woman who's used by it and condemned by it and uh, therefore a cabaret dancer okay so so far from india is the one that you told me played the new york festival so and it's also the one about exile right I think right the united states right and by that time, uh, as I, I, I've never seen it, but I understand that it is a, um, a kind of American style cinema verite kind of uh, documentary, is that correct? Um, <coughs> American style, I don't know, but um, it is a documentary, like my others have been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very small crew and mm -hmm. uh, not not nothing staged. You sort of live with the character you're shooting for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and shoot um, what you think is interesting, and then create a narrative structure or some sort of structure in the editing process. So that's the style it was. Um, and well, when I say American style, I, I, I just mean that up to this point, not many Indian documentary filmmakers had ever used. Sound oh, I see. Yes, it was Sink Sound. Definitely. And I, I, I'm told that it has no narration or very little narration. It has very little, yes. India Cabaret has none at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so with these films, you're certainly much more aligned, stylistically, I would say, with North America than with India. India. Sure, in that sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was just listening to the BBC critics about Salam Bombay the other day, and they had a similar reaction. They thought that the style was very uh, American. Have you had that response to it? Did they say how? Well, um, they were talking about it being. Um, I don't respect their opinion particularly because I think they were expecting certain kind of stereotypes of India. Mm -hmm. Like Oxfam type mm -hmm. images, mm -hmm. and when you got, when they got sort of a, an almost gentle, mm -hmm. um, I mean it's a very brutal story, but mm -hmm. at the same time there is there very mm -hmm. strong emotional mm -hmm. links between the characters. I think they they had their expectations overturned by that. Mm -hmm. uh, they had they saw it even as as a kind of um, romantic uh, narrative. God. <laughs> and they can it was quite an obnoxious critique. They said it was like going into an Indian restaurant, and some of the dishes on the restaurant are marked as extra spicy, and some of them are palatable for North American audiences. Huh. And they said that they found that maybe Salam Bombay was geared more towards the Western audiences. Really? But they're stupid. I should not have told you this because I don't respect this opinion at all. Well, it's, it's got a tremendous response in India. Has it? Yeah. I was wondering how it would go over in India. I mean, Indians love prizes abroad, so mm. I expect that, you know... But, you know, there are many f pr uh, films that have won prizes abroad that <coughs> uh, don't ever see a commercial release. And when I mean commercial, I mean commercial, you know, mm -hmm. um, in the sense that it's not a marginal film where you see in a film festival or you um, you know, see in a morning show in Regal or something. 
I mean, we, when Suni, Tara Purvala, and myself conceived and wrote this film, um, our primary audience, the pulse of our script and the story was India. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest was gravy for us. I mean, it is true that we are swimming in gravy, but um, it would nothing. The goal and the dream of this whole purpose is uh, is really opening in India pretty wide, and reaching as many people as possible there. Mm -hmm. So. You see it having commercial theatrical release. Yes. And so it'll have dubbed versions in the various regions. Where in India? Yeah. No. Well, it's in Hindi. So as much as Hindi films are seen. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe in the South they would want an English subtitled thing, but um, I really haven't gotten that far yet, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment we are considering opening the Bombay Territory and then the Delhi Territory and then seeing uh, maybe Calcutta, but that depends on whether we get an offer or not, you know. Right now these are the two that are being considered. Are you anticipating any problems with censorship in India? I did. I anticipated a lot of problems. Um, but the most amazing phone call I received on Wednesday morning was that the censor board had passed the film without a single cut. Wonderful, great. It was really a source of a great relief and and uh, you know hope for the, for the cinema. I mean, I really don't. This is amazing because uh, you know not only has uh, this famous kissing scene that everybody seems to be talking about in India, but it also has you know a very strong indictment against the government very directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also has a lot of uh, swear words, you know, mm -hmm. so things like that. So mm -hmm. um, really, I was really pleased about that. It also shows a very sensitive side of Indian society that sort of middle class Indians are, are a little bit embarrassed about showing to the West. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, aspects of it re reminded me of the whole Louis Mao controversy 15 years ago. Where uh, he didn't want sort of mm -hmm. the vulnerable side of Indian society just broadcast all over the world. And mm -hmm. so I wondered whether there'd be any reaction about that. Uh, not yet. Um, I think um, the I think I don't know. We just I just came back from India where I had shown it to specific audiences of. of well, besides the cast and the crew, the, you know, very big screenings for the government and, uh, and distributors. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, nobody o of those who had seen it brought up this issue that it's made for the West or anything. You know, it was accepted as something that was a story that they were very deeply involved with as soon as the film mm -hmm. began. Um, but... I, that's all. I don't remember what I was going to say. Well, I, I'm just curious about that. I mean, I also wondered about how India Cabaret went over in India. When I was there, people weren't talking about it very much. Um, I don't know how available it was over there, but I, I got the feeling that certain aspects of sexuality are, are, are a taboo area for yeah. discussion. Yes. And that maybe were a little bit embarrassed by it and yes. didn't want to talk too much about it. Yes. Did you find that? Yes. Very well, it it received a very contr you know, it was opened the film festival in this women's section and therefore got <coughs> excuse me. Kind of national publicity. Mm hmm Which is unusual for a documentary in any case. And uh, um and the extraordinary thing about actually showing it there was that we had to show this one-hour documentary, Cinema Verite or whatever, very um, unlike an Indian film that normally people buy tickets to go see. And yet we used to have these jammed audiences for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. 1,500 people are showing. And the point was, and the really amazing thing to me was, that the people in the audience were really riding with the movie. They mm -hmm. were really involved with the film. They didn't seem to be thinking or bothered about its form, you know, in the sense that it's not something they normally see or whatever. They were just involved in the characters. And um, here was a film that's, you know, uh, kind of about the extraordinariness of ordinary people. 
and they really got involved with the humor and the strength and awareness of particularly a couple of the women who are who really have a perspective on this society you know mm -hmm. and um, then there was a considerable amount of controversy stirred up by um, a lot of like women who were there calling who were feminists I guess and uh, who didn't think this who had also I feel come to this picture with a certain amount of preconceptions uh, wanting to um, you know be exposed to the victimization of these women and uh, to look you know to help them uplift themselves from the downtrodden and that kind of noble you know morality and the film is not at all moralizing it, it really celebrates the finally the spirit of survival of the women and 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 I think that um, for a woman like Rekha, who's a main cabaret dancer, I don't know anybody who could be more feminist, you know, mm -hmm. than she is. Um, so, despite the controversy, which continued for a couple of months in the press, mm -hmm. it did good business for my film. It was always jammed, 40, 40 screenings. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting to me was I, I really went anywhere with it, the anywhere where people would want to see it. So I showed it to a kind of cross-section in only the urban areas uh, with uh, like working class women and, and men and trade union groups, I remember, saw it, and film society people and college people, you know, anybody who invited me. And uh, the sense of identification, you know, between like secretaries, women who work as secretaries and who really have to, you know, mm -hmm. schlep every day, um, they really identified with a woman who's a stripper who would ordinarily they would consider or they wouldn't think about or they would think is a bad woman you know and I think so the film worked but also was very provocative mm -hmm. to um, especially men who didn't want who felt quite exposed by it you know mm -hmm. because uh, it was clearly a documentary and not fiction and men were like getting drunk and talking about how they had to come see a woman strip but would never marry them. I mean, the, it's, a, it's, it's an age-old story, but mm -hmm. it was, you know, it's not done to be seeing this on cinema, you know. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's very provocative. But uh, there is a life of the film in India. It's, it's in the film society circuit. Mm -hmm. And um, right now, after the success of Salam Bombay, I, I, um, I went to the television, you know, and I said, look, please. <laughs> Would you consider showing some of my past work? Because mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer will be. That probably be very favorable uh, now that uh, I mean I think this this prize will do a lot. Yeah. Towards providing a break through uh, for alternative kinds of films in India. Mm. That would be great. I think so. I mean the films that they've been pushing over the last couple of years. I think this new wave cinema. Decline somewhat, mm -hmm. and uh, I think this will sort of renew things a bit. Mm -hmm. In the sense, I don't know whether you saw the the sort of the main Indian film at Con. I found it really. Which one? Um, the Dave Dutkut. This time? Mm -hmm. Or or was it Berlin? Was it Berlin? Berlin. It was not a Con. Sure. Positive. I was there. Okay, but was was there an Indian film in, in the main competition? No. Okay, so it was Berlin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just thought it was a tired old uh, yeah. art film. And uh -huh. So hopefully that there'll be sort of a new interest in films that are really uh -huh. at the pulse uh -huh. of the audience and with some things that are going on. Uh -huh. um, okay, so we've talked about so far from India. Um, and I guess Children of the Desired Sex you've been working on, you said it was part of this women development uh, series? Yes, it's the first film I haven't produced. Um, th th it's a film as part of a six-part series on women and development all over the world, produced by a women's company here in Montreal, in fact, mm -hmm. Cine Contact. And um, it's a film I've always wanted to make, uh, and it's my first like purely current affairs kind of movie. Unfortunately, it's not shown as currently as it was made. Uh, and it's on the whole amniocentesis problem about mm -hmm. using amniocentesis as a sex determination test uh, to see if you have a girl or a boy, and mm -hmm. if you have a girl, it's an abortion. Mm -hmm. 
and it's a portrait of a clinic in Dada, in Bombay. Mm -hmm. um, with, uh, in the words of many women who come um, to get this done to themselves, and they speak, you know, of their personal dilemmas as to why they're there, mm -hmm. and what led them there, mm -hmm. and uh, the film also ex re interviews and exposes practically the 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 people who own the clinic and run it as a means of family planning, you know, so under the umbrella of family planning. Mm -hmm. And then the government, you know, the All India Medical Institute in Delhi, who say we've banned it and pretended nothing exists, you know, when, when advertisements are screening these service all over the cities. So the film, of course, uh, ex you know, describes this phenomenon, but also gets under the skin, I hope, a little bit, and mm -hmm. uh, through the words of the women, you know, tries to um, reveal the dilemma, you know. It's like very easy to say this phenomenon is terrible, and it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But when you have, uh, when you see, in the words of a woman who has already had a few daughters, or her life would be that much more oppressed if she were to have another daughter, you know, to hear that from a woman, or many women, mm -hmm. is very unsettling, you know. So, so you're not condemning anyone in the film except the people who are exploiting this. this and, and the government, and the government, because they pretend it's not happening, and, uh, and the idea <coughs> is not to ban it and think it's banned, but of course it's a longer term idea, mm -hmm. but the point is, in the short term, they have to address themselves to this mm -hmm. situation, which is grown in leaps and bounds since we stopped, since we ended the film. When I was there, um, the Maharashtra government had just banned it all. Yeah, well. But I'm sure that might have been the same effect. Yeah. So, it's principally a, an interview film. I haven't seen it. It's passing in a couple of days. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot of it's what I said, yeah, it's a lot of talking heads in a way, mm -hmm. but see it, <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, how are you holding up? In I'm not feeling well at all, <laughs> but I'll do it. I'm just, when I have these headaches, I, I can't see light, so it's a bit crazy. Do you want me to switch the light? Above? No, it's fine, you won't get light then, you know. Is it in your eye? No. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Okay. Well, we won't take long. I really feel bad. Having I'm so sorry. No, you're not exploiting me. This is, <laughs> this is uh, chosen <laughs> okay, um, and agreed to. Okay. Well, let's move quickly and get it over with. Um, you've also <coughs> had your film shown on television. Yes. Can you talk about Western audiences, television audiences versus festival audiences in the West, and how the response tends to be? Um, um a fest in the festival circuit, it has normally been very lively and very much there, you know. Um, and often, sometimes, quite successful. Um, it's shown on television. All my films have actually nine or ten countries or something. But I find television very alienating because mm -hmm. I don't get a sense of what people think about it. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes it is remarkable the kind of power of television in the sense of how many people it reaches. So that you know, on a plane somewhere or somewhere, and so some, you meet somebody who's seen your film in some other country from Finland or whatever. And that is startling, you know. Mm -hmm. But on a just a regular, like you know, day-to-day -day level, one doesn't really know, how, mm -hmm. you know, what they think of it, you know. So, but it's it's good that it's seen, and I know it it, uh, it reaches people. But y yeah, I have had my films shown. It must be necessary for financing, is it, to 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 get to sell it to Channel Four and to PBS? 
BBS is always after the fact. I mean, you know, it's mm -hmm. and I've only sold one film to them. Uh, but uh, Channel 4 is not just necessary for financing. I mean, it is, uh, it is a great feeling to have the film shown, you know, uh, to so many people. But uh, I just uh, expressed a personal feeling that it's alienating a little bit. But um, of course it does help on the financial front. Was it difficult to get an FTC financing for for my mom? Um, no, actually it wasn't. Um, they, I went through the normal route of putting the script through, and then it was. I was asked with Suni to sp speak to the script committee because they had a few questions about whether, what it, you know. So we did that, and then. Um, Finally, I mean, I just couldn't raise any money elsewhere. Nobody gave me any money in India because they just thought it was commercially too problematic and they just didn't even consider it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to go back to the NFTC and, you know, and invited them to this workshop that we had with the street kids for three months. And they just liked what we, they saw. And, and they had to move very fast because I, the, my whole pressure was because of wanting to shoot right after the workshop because the kids had all been psyched for it, and, and also because of the Ganpati Festival, which is the finale mm -hmm. of the film, was the first day of shooting, and we couldn't miss that. And so they stepped up right away, you know, in a week or something. But I had already gone through the whole process before. It's not like I had just gone in there that week, you know. What were their initial problems with the script? I don't even remember. Just, you know, ev there were all these script writers in the committee, and each one had a different artistic notion of what we should do, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like a committee thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the experience. Yeah. Mm. What was your budget? About $900,000. Mm -hmm. And how much of that came from NFTC? 150000 I see. So the rest came from television abroad. Mm -hmm. And from myself money I had raised pri privately. I see. So could you talk a little bit um, more about these workshops and recruiting your children and uh, developing the script? Um, well, we initially developed the script, uh, Suni and I, are researching um, for two months in a very documentary style in Bombay, talking to children on the streets. We got to know one gang, especially on Grant Road. Um, going into a jail and uh, talking to about 200 children, you know, si singularly into brothels with the same thing, talking to madams and, and young girls who had just come, and, um, and remand homes, the chiller room, which has existed in the film. Um, and we collected a lot of this information. We also talked to a number of people who use this, this area, you know, richer people or people who just go and get... And so we tried to get as much of a whole, you know, view on it as possible and get inside it as much as possible. And then um, it created the script, which was a combination of some of the reality that we had encountered, but also a fair amount from Sunni's own imagination and mm -hmm. a fair amount from my own work in documentary, you know, with Rekha, for instance, of India Cabaret, who very much inspired the character of Rekha and Salam Bombay, etc. Um, that took about a year. and. Uh, it was always my intention from the beginning of uh, doing this film that uh, we would work with uh, children from the street and, uh, and not with actors. And um, in June, uh, two of my assistant directors, uh, both women, um, walked the streets of the inner city. W we knew we were going to shoot around Grant Road, and we rented a room in Grant Road for this workshop. And they talked to kids and told them that we were doing a workshop about their lives, sort of kept it quite vague. And uh, I invited Barry John, who's a theater director in Delhi, to come and coordinate it, because he's very gifted with children, and Raghubir Yadav, who plays Chilam in the film, mm -hmm. also. And that was our team. And uh, for in the first three days, 130 children showed up, and we chose uh, 24 of them, mm -hmm. and uh, worked with those kids for about seven weeks um, every day, and really you know, gained a pretty amazing rapport with each other and trained each other, you know, and cast the film like that. Um, and uh, we've wor been working with the film, with the kids full time, practically, since we stopped shooting. Uh, you know, each kid wants to do a different thing and trying to make that happen. 
uh, some are doing well and some are not and uh, um, just about last month I was in India and we set up the Salam Bombay Trust uh, which from proceeds of the film in India will create a learning center what we've called right now the learning center much like the workshop but which will be permanent on an ongoing basis and staffed um, we hope it will operate in November in Bombay mm. in the same neighborhood yes roughly you know did the children have any input into the script yes uh, a lot of details that we uh, a, a lot of details found themselves into the script you know and um, and also while we were shooting you know a lot uh, like one of our kids had been many of our kids had been in the chiller room and when we were shooting in the chiller room they were constantly giving me little details you know like after the prayer they say long live India you know and things like that that are great very ironic sort of powerful details and you call uh, it the chiller room chiller room no. chiller. chiller is a slang it's how the kids say it chiller is a uh, small change in Hindi and uh, also it's, it's it's the way they pronounce children's room. Okay, okay. Can I just stop for a moment? Sure, of I course. just want to.